All right. Well, good afternoon, good morning, whatever, wherever you are. Um, I'm Natalie. I'm the Director for Partnerships and Member Engagement with Campus Compact. So we are excited to be hosting our last of a three-part series of community college webinars today. So we're going to be talking about um, advancing democracy through virtual deliberative dialogues. So excited to have Nick Longo and Lena Jones here, both of whom have been working as fellows with us this year, Nick specifically in the dialogue space and Lena um, with our community colleges. So I'm going to hand it over to them to get started. Thank you both for being here. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much. Um, hopefully you could all see my screen. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. This is really exciting. And, and with my great friend, colleague, uh, Lena Jones, we're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to introduce the session. Um, and so maybe I'll just go to the next slide and then we'll get we'll start from there. Just to let you know what we're up to today. So here's our agenda. Um, so we are going to do welcome and introductions, get a chance to know who's on this converse, as part of this conversation. Then we're going to give a little bit of an overview of the context of kind of democracy in crisis. Uh, Lena's going to present some of her research on community colleges. Um, then I'm going to uh, introduce a new tool that we've just developed called Practicing Democracy, which might be useful for your work in, in whatever setting you're in, but for sure it's geared for kind of a practical tool for civic learning uh, in higher education. And then we'll do some discussion and kind of maybe introduce a reflective activity depending on, on what our timing looks like. I will turn it over to Lena maybe, and we're gonna both just do a little bit of introducing ourselves and then we're gonna have everyone else on the call and do some introductions. So Lena, do you wanna start? as well. Okay. I'm Lena Jones. I am a uh, one of the Campus Compact uh, fellows, community college fellows uh, this academic year, and I am a, a um, political science instructor at Minneapolis College in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I have a long history <laughs> of, of, um, of doing all sorts of work related to civic engagement, both on my campus um, through a variety of initiatives, including um, you know public achievement, which is how I I think that's how we first connected, Nick, you know, and um, and the community development program, which which I uh, coordinate on my campus as well, you know, as well as other things, which I, which I don't need to go into, but um, it's all kind of motivated by some of the, the key tenants that, um, that Nick will be talking about, you know, that emerge in this, in this, this model of, of civic professionalism, you know, but, but again, a lot of my work is around uh, creating spaces for, for students and other actors to, you know, to, to collectively like create power and move things, you know, that's kind of what, what motivates what I do in the classroom and outside of the classroom. You know, so, so yeah, I think that's enough from, from, you know, for now from me, Nick, do you mm -hmm. want to uh, share a little bit more about yourself? For, for sure. I love that line, create power and move things. That's such a beautiful way to describe your work and, and kind of an ideal to move towards. Um, so I'm Nick Longo. I'm a faculty member at Providence College then also on the board of uh, the br a brand new college and also teach with College Unbound, which is an adult kind of a completion uh, higher ed institution in Providence, but also now is expanding to Philadelphia and Chicago and some other places. Um, so I have the opportunity to work with both undergraduate kind of traditional age, 18 to 22 year olds at Providence College and then with adults uh, with College Unbound. And the toolkit that I'll be work, talking through, I've worked and kind of developed with both those groups of students. I'll, I'll just say really quickly, like this idea from Parker Palmer, and this is kind of what we want to introduce and ask you to respond to is, do you have a well-grounded personal experience and conviction concerning whatever it is you're trying to teach? Uh, and for me, it's to really bring a civic perspective to the work that I'm doing. And that, that's kind of grounded in my experience uh, as an undergraduate, and then in grad student. And so really my kind of formative educational experience has been trying to think through like 
how could I be a student? And then how could I do work? And at the same time, how can I try and change the world and have an impact on the world? Or, you know, like Lena says, create power and move things and not kind of be a divided self, but really try to bring those ideas together. And I feel like bringing a civic lens to my work has allowed me to do, to do that. Um, and I've done that kind of my dissertation research was on the Highlander Folk School and the Hull House. So it was kind of two adult educational centers uh, historically, and then I did a contemporary model with the Jane Addams School in the in the Twin Cities, and so that's my grounding has been in adult education, and so I'm I'm really interested in this conversation and really see community colleges, really as kind of pillars of democracy and the work that we're we're trying to do, but also work that's under siege in in a lot of ways right now. So we are excited to now have you uh, to get a chance to introduce you. So. We wonder if you could just say hello and just kind of where you teach and why you're interested in bringing a civic perspective to your work in community colleges. I think we're probably a small enough group that I see we can stop share maybe just um, ask folks to do this really quickly or we getting well we're getting a little bit bigger maybe what do you think Lena? should we have people do this in the maybe where you're maybe you could just say your name and where you're from in the chat. And then maybe just so we'll we'll kind of get the bio information, but then maybe each person could just say really quickly, like kind of how you're trying to bring a civic perspective or kind of what you're what you're interested in in, in taking from this session. Um, and maybe Melanie, would you be willing to go first? So if you put your bio in the in the chat, we don't have to go through all that. Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so Melanie Strout, um, University of Bridgeport. I'm the director of civic engagement. Um, I do teach a first year seminar class. And so we do try to incorporate um, that into the first year experience and just understanding the importance of being part of community, um, not just on campus, but also the community that our institution is located in and how we can give back. And so I'm looking forward to learning more about um, how everyone else has included this in their work. Um, just for, I'll just call that David. Would you be willing to go next? Uh, thanks, Nick. David Bodery. And uh, I think my connection is through my discipline of communication. So I am teaching mostly public speaking. I'm chair of the department, which includes journalism too. So there's all kinds of civic and uh, sort of um, democracy with a small d, right? Um, connected sorts of things. Uh, I believe, as you do, that we are sort of the place where citizens become educated on how to be effective citizens in what we hope could be a democracy. Although in Ohio, we don't see it happening very well. That's awesome. Exciting to hear about your work. Um, and yeah, I think that a lot of places right now, there, there are statewide struggles around, around these issues, which we'll talk more about. Uh, next on my list is uh, Stephen Arthur, Stephen Arthur. Hey, good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, I guess, depending on the time zone. Uh, so my name is Stephen Arthur, he and his pronouns. Um, what I'm really interested about this session is that um, our Office of Civic Leadership Development is really new. This is our first year. Um, and so the, the great thing about that is that we had an opportunity to try out a whole bunch of different stuff from poster campaigns to a podcast. And so I'm just trying to learn more about what folks are doing to engage students on their campus and have these civic conversations. Thanks. Uh, Amanda? Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda. Um, I'm really just interested um, from the aspect of community college, we're getting asked to do more virtual. And so how to have that virtual component of those conversations that sometimes take place in the classroom or at community events. And then Olivia? Um, I'm Olivia Edwards. I work at Community College of Philadelphia in our Institute for Community Engagement and Civic Leadership. I help oversee our hashtag CCP Votes program um, and also oversee a group of student fellows who are really engaged um, in work on campus, engaging their peers in voter registration and voter education efforts. So just excited to learn from you all. Thanks so much. Uh, Abby. 
um, a lot like Amanda said, you know, more and more we are moving into virtual spaces and with Eastern Gateway Community College having um, students in all 50 states uh, doing a lot of virtual programming. I really want to see how I can move some of our conversations in that direction and how students can be advocates in their own communities wherever they are. And then locally here with our students, um, you know, some different policies, especially around DEI uh, education and departments in Ohio, uh, you know, how we can be a voice to support those programs. Thanks, Abby. Uh, Eric. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Eric Vanover from Germanic Community College in Virginia. Um, so our purpose uh, for being here today is essentially uh, the state of Virginia selected civic engagement as one of its uh, six core um, general education competencies. So uh, we created a plan and have learning outcomes that are embedded in specific courses that we selected at each college. Um, but the major purpose is as we're trial and error learning how that looks in, in the assessment world, uh, finding new ways and creative ways to help uh, provide some professional development for more faculty and more disciplines to kind of help us engage and, and um, infuse civic learning more across the curriculum rather than a few select disciplines that are um, in our competency matrix. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Demi. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. My name is Demi. I work in the Center for Community and Civic Engagement at Mesa Community College in Arizona. And I'm a new hire actually. So I'm just here to absorb as much information and learn as much as I can. Great, well, congratulations on your new position. Uh, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Kakbe. I'm the Assistant Director at um, SUNY Buffalo State in Buffalo, New York. Um, similar to Demi, I'm also new in my position and trying to build on existing um, initiatives and programming that we have but we're looking to, to kind of look for new, new ways to reach the students, working with a, a professor in the social work department to get conversation going on voter engagement and peer-to-peer -peer conversation. And so looking to have that, um, to, to find just new resources and new tools. Thanks, um, Michelle. Hi everyone, um, I'm Michelle Lopez. I'm with Community College of Philadelphia, working um, alongside of Olivia Edwards. So we do um, we do have some civics education programming already. Some of it is virtual. They are mainly um, provided by some uh, community partners of ours. So looking to learn more of how to infuse um, some more of CCP into our partnership programming. So thank you. Oh, great. Oh, and it's so great that two of you are on. Uh, that you get to work together and, and be part of this. Uh, Wendy. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Wendy Jeske, and I um, am in student engagement at Flathead Valley Community College in uh, northwest corner of Montana. Um, I joined because I was interested to see what you all are doing. Um, I currently oversee all of our community involvement programming on our campus. Um, as probably with a lot of other smaller schools, we wear a lot of hats, but um, service learning and uh, community-based work study and a lot of those things, service Saturdays we do, um, but have really stepped it up the last year or two in our democratic engagement planning and um, hoping to work with um, the Unify America Challenge, um, which is something new, just connect. We're so isolated up here in Northwest Montana. We're just trying to connect our students with other students. Um, in other locations, which we're hoping that'll help, you know, spur engagement. So yeah, just here to learn. That's fabulous. I'm so glad you, and, and that's why we're also spending some time doing these introductions is because this is your network, these are your people. So it's great yeah. for you to get a chance to meet each other. Uh, Diane. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm from uh, Cumberland, Maryland, which is the farthest outreaches of uh, Maryland and up in the mountains, very rural area. Um, Commun Allegheny College of Maryland, a community college. Uh, I teach online. I teach in person. I'm a sociology professor, but I'm also the uh, College to Community Partnership Center person, which we go with the Carnegie Foundation, Carnegie Community Engagement Classification, which helps us frame that and just looking for ways 
to beef up just like everybody else, our democracy efforts are talking across divides and engaging students in different perspectives. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you, so glad you're here. Uh, and then Shaquan. Hey everyone, uh, sorry I was a little bit late, but uh, I'm Shaquan, I'm with Campus Compact. I work with Natalie uh, with all of our things related to membership. Uh, and yeah, I just um, enjoy being in this space and a part of these conversations. Uh, I've been a part of our community college network over the last couple of months, uh, as well as um, leading a COP directed uh, on, um, on having these conversations in regards to diversity and community college spaces. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm just super excited to be a part of the conversation and just listen in uh, today as well. So hello to all of you. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I think that's everybody. Uh, so I'm going to bring our PowerPoint back up. Let me just say we're, so I'm going to talk for like five minutes instead of context, and then we're actually going to do some more interactive stuff. Uh, and then Lena's going to um, report out on some of her research. Throughout, as we're talking, like the one thing that we think is really powerful about online spaces is the ability to kind of multitask and do, especially in conversation with each other. So we invite you and encourage you to use the chat function and kind of comment, ask questions, have conversations while we're part of this time together over the next 45 minutes. So for sure, like when I'm not talking, I will be on the chat, like I'll be posting stuff. So you all feel free to do that as well. Um, so just want to give a quick context. Uh, so, so many of you are doing this work in kind of civic engagement centers and community colleges, you're wearing many different hats and kind of the broad kind of call to the work that we're doing is around the crisis of democracy. I mean, if you see what happened on, on January 6th and kind of just put on the news and the polarization and, and you kind of know there's a crisis in democracy, but what's underlying it? And there's a couple of different uh, kind of causes we just want to talk about. One is just the loss of trust. You see that it, almost any indicator you look at, there's a, a steep decline in trust in institutions. But one of the things that our research has found is that that trust goes both ways. And so people don't trust institutions. They don't trust Congress. They don't trust the you know, Supreme Court, the media. It's, but it's possible because those institutions don't trust people. They're not given you know, opportunities for ordinary people to be involved in decision-making. So citizens are often on the sidelines and you're seeing more and more loss of trust in higher education as well. And this is especially pronounced among Republican respondents. So that's kind of a piece of why we have a crisis of democracy is that we don't trust the institutions, we don't trust each other. A second piece is this kind of like this uh, kind of twin challenges of isol isolation and polarization. So more and more, especially we saw this with COVID, but people are bowling alone. People are not having social connections, but especially not having social connections across differences where we're more and more polarized into our camps and we don't know how to talk across differences. And that's a, that's a part of a kind of underlying crisis of democracy. And the last piece of this is that we have a set of challenges that folks call you know wicked challenges or adaptive challenges. And those are problems that can't be solved with technical expertise alone, right? So something like climate change, anti-racism, educational inequity, um, you know, housing crisis. Those aren't like we could come up with a one magic bullet or a technical solution. Those are really problems, challenges that require new ways of thinking and acting. And more and more democracy itself is becoming a, a really a wicked adaptive challenge. So another piece of this is that higher education has a role that we're seeing, you know, facts don't matter. You know, this is a, a New Yorker cartoon where it says, I'm sorry, Jenny, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours. So he gets the points. So we live in a society that this is kind of where the world we live in, but higher education has an important role of being the arbiter of facts, you know, helping the next generation of folks think about and how to understand how knowledge is constructed and, and agreed upon. At the same time, our institutions of higher education have these free speech controversies. We see it everywhere from Stanford University, a recent controversy around speakers coming on campus to, um, you know, controversies about, you know, what, you know, getting called out for language that folks use on campus. 
So we're living in a time of not only alternative facts, but where hate speech and free speech are, there's a fine line between them. And part of our work is to kind of create space and opportunities to come to some agreement about what that means. Higher ed is also at a crossroads. So if you think about our higher ed institutions, more and more higher ed is kind of being, you know, neoliberal market-driven, highly privatized university. And this is across any of our institutions, public and private. At the same time, our, you know, as we're talking about the, the, the kind of cancel culture and some of the challenges in higher education in places like Ohio, um, Florida, Texas, you'll see the higher education has become a site for culture wars about what we can teach, what we can't teach. I think, you know, tensions around critical race theory, tenure and promotion, all these aspects are becoming more and more center of the culture war. And then we're also living in a time where our communities have these wicked problems, these challenges, and we need campuses and we need especially community colleges to be engaged in public problem solving. And at the same time, we're, we're not doing so great. And I love this uh, kind of idea from Ira Harkavy. He says, you know, how do we have the problems we have in society if we have such great universities? You know, I think our universities are something that if someone came and just like looked at our society and said, what are some of the most amazing uh, kind of majestic places? They would say our institutions of higher education, but too often they're disconnected from kind of public challenges and problem solving. So part of what the response Lena and I have been talking about as part of our conversations with the Kettering Foundation and our work together in places like public achievement is that, you know, if we believe in a democratic society, we need to create spaces for democracy. You know, we can't just talk about it as an abstract idea. We need to create spaces in our classroom and our campuses, which are engaged in, and Miles Horton talks about this, is, is, you know, when we believe in a democratic society, you provide a setting for education that's democratic. And I think uh, out of my research, like there's three different ways you can do this. So I'm just gonna quickly go over these three, three ways and then I'm gonna and turn it over to Lena. So first is that we need to think about our education more deliberatively. So if you think about this, this uh, kind of virtual dialogue and the idea of you know, how learning how to talk to each other is an important component of democracy. It, Beverly Tatum talked about this best. He says, you know, you can't solve a problem if you can't talk about it. And there's at least four different ways that folks think about dialogue and deliberation. And this chart from the uh, National Center for a Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation gets at it. So one is around exploration, just getting folks to learn how to tell stories and talk to each other, use things like world cafe, story circles. Um, so it's just a really opening up space for people from differences, different backgrounds in our classrooms and our campuses and our communities to talk to each other. Just a really kind of baseline idea of being more deliberative. Then we could, but we could also think about being more deliberative about conflict resolution. So think about truth and reconciliation in, in a place like really stark contrast in a place like you know South Africa, but more and more thinking about in our communities and our campuses, how we do and build community standards and come to resolution around conflict through dialogue. A third piece of the kind of deliberative nature is around decision-making. So we think about things like participatory budgeting, like who makes decisions about how our budgets look and how funds are used in our local governments, in our community agencies, in our foundations, in our campuses. And there's a whole movement around participatory budgeting, which is saying like, we need to be deliberative about making those decisions and giving that power to ordinary people or the people most affected by funding decisions. And the last piece is, is like not being deliberative just to talk, but to literally lead towards action. And you think about a place like the study circles and everyday democracy, where they say, you know, we need to bring people together over a sustained period of time to go from talk to action. So education needs to be more deliberative. It also has to be more asset-based. And what asset-based means is that we need to think about our communities, not just as places with problems or challenges, but places with this rich set of gifts and assets and talents. And I love this photo. So this photo here, it comes from, a course in uh, the University of Cape Town was taught by Janice McMillan, 100 students who are engineering students, and they were studying social infrastructure. And this specific session was on knowledge. And Janice said, yeah, who in this class speaks another language? Could you come up to the board and translate that into another language? And pretty quickly, like 20 different people ran up and we had such a vast array of resources in that class of linguistics ability. 
And if we just kind of in a normal classroom where our faculty member was just lecturing, we would never know about or tap into those capacities. So we have to really think about if we want to be democratic in our spaces, what are the assets and how do we recognize the talents, skills and experiences of the folks, not only our students, but also our, our communities that are that are that we're embedded in. And then finally, to think about our, our space and in our educational settings as more collaborative. And about 25 years ago now, Barr and Tag wrote this pretty seminal article. And it was about shifting from an instructional paradigm to a learning paradigm, right? So like, instead of just thinking about kind of rote memorization and kind of traditional learning, they said, you know, instruction, we have to think about a learning paradigm. And I think now 25 years later, we're actually in the midst of a new paradigm shift. And it's shifting from the learning paradigm, which was important, to a collaborative paradigm, which is really about the co-construction and co-creation of knowledge and really thinking about how we can, uh, as we go into a space of learning, say, you know, what kind of knowledge do we have here and how do we co-create and produce products that are useful based on the folks we have in our room? So it's a little bit different from a learning paradigm where you're kind of catalyzing and co-facilitating knowledge. Um, and I think Maya Angelou has this beautiful poem where she talks about the importance of that we can't do things alone. We really have to come together. And it's uh, the idea of an organizer said to me once is like one plus one is greater than two. So the act of collaboration, we're actually building social capital and learning how to collaborate. And it's part of what we want to do with you today as we give you chances to, to be able to engage and talk with each other. Uh, so I'm going to stop here and turn it back over to, to Lena. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about some research that I'm engaged in related to civic and community engagement at community colleges, and um, and part of this this uh, segment will include uh, some some breakout groups too, because I, I I think it's important for us to to talk to each other and share a little bit about what's happening at our respective campuses as well. So. Um, I will share. Okay, let's make that larger. Okay, so um, as part of my fellowship with Campus Compact, I'm doing a um, a research project that emerged out of just my curiosity about what the heck is happening at other community colleges, <laughs> you know, particularly in this really um, interesting moment, you know, in the sort of aftermath of a pandemic, you know, in uh, a rather, you know, uh, a unique, <laughs> um, you know, political, social, economic context. Um, like, what's what's happening? You know, and and this emerged too out of um, a meeting that was held, I guess, about a year ago now. You know, of practitioners from community colleges and 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 being in this space and realizing that we both had a, a lot in common as far as what we were experiencing at our institutions, but there are also quite a bit of differences as well. You know, so just wanting to, to tease those out and, and also um, provide some, some feedback, uh, particularly, you know, for, for Campus Compact about like the needs of uh, community college members as well and how, how they might be similar or different than, than the needs of other types of higher education institutions. So, so there are a few questions that I'm exploring in this research, and these are just a few of them here. You know, there, there are others as well. You know, but the one is, you know, where and how is civic and community engagement living at our colleges at this historical moment? Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic and other uh, political, social, economic aspects of this moment affected civic and community engagement? at community college or at our institutions, because I know some of us aren't from community colleges. Um, anyway, I'm gonna ask you to kind of explore these questions. Um, 
but my research focuses on community colleges. And then what is unique about the opportunities and challenges at community colleges? And um, what is unique about the needs of uh, particularly uh, civic and community engagement practitioners at, at community colleges? So I'd like us, before I kind of share a little bit of what I found so far, um, I would love for us as a group to have a chance to share some of our uh, perspectives on these two questions, which I'm going to paste in the chat. Like where and how is civic and community engagement living at, at your college at this particular moment? Like where, where is it, you know, is it, is it, yeah. You know, some places have really kind of centralized models. Some, you know, have models that are quite, you know, um, you know, situations where it lives in many different places in the institution. Um, and then, and then um, I'm really interested actually, and probably even more interested in the second question, like how, how has the pandemic and, and everything that's happened in that kind of, you know, group of years, <laughs> like how has that affected um, what's what's happening at your college as far as civic and community engagement? You know, and, and you know, as the dust is is kind of settling, like what are you, what are you seeing? You know, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and then here are the questions and okay so i'm looking at the time so should we do uh okay mm, mm, mm. let's see should we really, still think, what do you think, think nick small groups will work like just groups of two or three Good. and just okay. for like five minutes do that Okay, yep. All right, let's do that. Well, I was going to ask Alina a question, but I will. Uh, I'll wait till uh, Jill figure. I was going to see how she's going to report out, but that's all right. Oh, you know what? There is one person that got put in a room with you, and they're alone. Uh, I'm going to move her. Let's see room two. Okay, that way. She's in a different room. There we go. Okay, <laughs> I can like see when she gets in or not. So, all right. So just five minutes. Oh, if you're talking, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, I would say by like 2.39. Great. Okay, great.
that one fast. All right, welcome back, everyone. Wow, we had a really uh, nice but quick conversation in in my group. So um, I'll share a little, uh, quickly share some of, of, of my preliminary find, findings, and then I'm going to invite you to participate in, in my research as well, because I would love to talk to them. <clears throat> and, then, and then I'll turn it back to Nick. So I will, I'm going to go back to the share. Big. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so really quickly, you know. Um, so again, I've I've had conversations with folks from, I think now about only about fifteen institutions, you know, in a variety of different roles, but that do some sort of practice related to civic and community engagement on their campuses. And also been in a bunch of spaces, for instance, our community college network meetings where there have been other um, other people and roles and institutions represented and, and meetings as well. You know, some so from all of those things, you know, I've I've so far gathered a, a few things. You know, as far as institutional arrangements, there's a wide variety of arrangements and and, and that exist at community colleges, you know, and, um, but there's some interesting trends that, that I've been seeing, you know, in my conversations and in the surveys also, um, you know, changes in campus traffic, you know, uh, the, the numbers of people, you know, both faculty and students, you know, that are on campus and, and most of the time, you know, pretty significant decline. You know, along with that, a lot of our institutions are experiencing some enrollment declines as well, and this has, you know, some clear implications too, as far as you know the work that's happening around around civic and community engagement as well, you know, and relationships with community partners and so forth. A lot of campuses, it's interesting, you know, particularly ones that, um, and and particularly the ones that have had pretty robust uh, service learning. Um, operations on their campus, you know, in quite a few classes, um, have seen significant drops, um, you know, in in the number of of service learning offerings as well. And some of the reasons behind that are varied, um, you know. But uh, the pandemic being, you know, one of the the clear reasons for that, and the the, the difficulty and impossibility of you know placements, but. But anyway, that's something that's been pretty prominent in a lot of the conversations. And along with that being some, in some context, some sort of soul searching as far as like what your role is at the college with that role gone, but also kind of this dynamic where, okay, so you're not doing that. So you're kind of filling in the gaps in other places at the college, you know, and, and one of those gaps that several uh, of the people I've spoken to have ended up filling is like an, an increased um, focus or, or, or uh, um, of their role on on serving basic needs of students. So several um, people who I've spoken to have, for instance, shifted a lot of their time towards, say, running and coordinating a food pantry, for instance. Mm. Um, a lot of emphasis, more emphasis on uh, workforce development and and diversity and equity initiatives, you know, as well, and and increasing interest um, or emphasis on on ways to kind of integrate that with with kind of community, you know, kind of traditional community engagement, civic engagement type work as well. Some of the challenges that have come up in the surveys and and conversations include that increase in political polarization and how this affects you know faculty how it affects students and their willingness to engage in you know these you know uh, in in civic engagement activities you know in in dialogues and otherwise you know for instance um 
you know, one faculty member, actually a couple have, have noted how, for instance, um, flack they've received from people they've invited to their classes, for instance, you know, has kind of put, um, you know, a chilling effect, you know, on, um, on what they do and, and, and what others do as well. Um, navigating tensions between kind of this desire for experimentation, innovation, and, and survival. Um, a lot of folks talked about kind of the, the challenges of documenting what they actually do and, and, and how it works, whether it works, and not having the, the resources, time to do that. Uh, lots of stuff related to budgets, you know, um, not only just the lack of money, but just, you know, kind of the inconsistency of, of funding, you know, and how that affects, you know, one's ability to plan, you know, in the long term, you know, one's job security and, and so forth, uh, commitments to partners, uh, support from uh, upper college leadership, uh, particularly material support. You know, so lots of talk about, yeah, we love what you're doing, but we're not going to give you any money to do anything. And then um, leadership turnover and also faculty turnover is something that's come up in a lot of conversations. And then just kind of this general um, state of being overwhelmed, you know, amongst faculty who, again, who many of whom have had to make this tremendous shift from in person to to kind of online modes of teaching, you know, and, um, and again, you know, like the rest of us, we're, we're all living through the, a pandemic, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, all living in the world. So the challenges related to that too, and the students, you know, uh, grappling with, with similar things. So um, several opportunities kind of came up in these conversations as well include um, thinking about the ways that um, we can use the unique position of community colleges um, you know, at this moment, you know, as, as college, you know, their accessibility, you know, one person noted their, um, kind of their, 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 their status as being a bit closer to the people and less elitist, you know, in certain contexts. Um, and then other opportunities here as well, and I'm looking at the time, so I want to make sure Nick has time, but, but again, it kind of an opportunity again to just, you know, at this moment of upheaval, you know, to just kind of reassess what works, what doesn't, and and hopefully create something new. And one of the exciting things, you know, both in my own personal work and in the work of some of the folks who have been talking to as well, is the possibilities of like engaging students in, in new ways around like shaping what civic and community engagement looks like on our campuses. Like not just like in, you know, shaping particular programs or campaigns, but kind of shaping, shaping the infrastructure that we create, you know, in this, in this new moment. So anyway, I'm going to stop there uh, because Nick has some amazing stuff to share from this guide as well. And feel free to comment too, you know, and if there are things that resonate and questions and so forth. Anyway, okay. That was super helpful. Um... I'm gonna put, so Lena, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that sort of articulated I put in the chat, but yes, feel free to engage with some of the these insights, the work, like your small, the, our small group conversation was really paralleled your insights with this okay. larger survey. So it, that's the more uh, kind of validation for those um, points. So what, what, one of the things we wanted to leave you with in these last uh, 10 minutes is, you know, we're, we're kind of overwhelmed on our campuses. We see some of these challenges, but we also see the potential for community colleges and, and kind of ways that you could do civic work, especially coming out of the pandemic. So we wanna um, talk to you about a guide that uh, Campus Compact and AAC and you just published. It came out of some work that Lena and I were part of in a conversation on civic professionalism. And the link to the guide, Practicing Democracy, I just put in the chat. And I'm going to share my screen and just quickly show you. Um, so the kind of framing language, and I think this is actually useful for 
community colleges, especially as you're, you're more and more kind of being pushed towards, and we're all in higher ed being pushed towards kind of workforce development, is really thinking about this language of civic professionalism. So as we're you know, doing workforce development, how do we think about the civic dimension of the work? And it's not either or, it's not either we're preparing them to be civically engaged or prepared to be uh, in the workforce and have jobs and careers and callings, but we're able to connect them. And part of that is by thinking about folks as civic professionals and future civic professionals. And those are people who have a public identity, deliberative way of acting that enables them to share power, work collaboratively and engage the public. And those are think, folks who have a deliberative way of doing things, think about things in an asset-based way and are collaborative. So the kinds of spaces we wanna create in our classrooms are modeling the kinds of civic professional that we're hoping to see uh, among, among students. So the work of civic professionals, you know, it's about engaging folks on how to name and frame issues. It's not just working with the usual suspects. And it's, this is important, you know, civic professional is not about um, professionalizing citizenship. It's really about rethinking and democratizing the professionals. So kind of, we have so much in power in institutions. So how do we democratize those institutions? Uh, here's a kind of a list, and this has come from the guide, so you can take a look at this, but these are a list of kind of uh, traits of civic professionals. Um, I'm not going to get into that chart, but I want, because I want to introduce this guide. So this is Practicing Democracy. Uh, it's a really practical toolkit that's framed in different sections around shaping culture, developing concepts, building skills, um, uh, putting work into practice. There's an assessment rubric. So this is kind of just one example of what one of the chapters look like. So it's around shaping culture and developing a community learning agreement. Each of the chapters has a different section. They all have learning objectives. So this one's developing a community learning agreement for joint learning among a group. They all have like an introduction to a lesson overview. Each of the lessons are 40, 75 minutes. So these are the things that you could use in your class. They're meant to be, you could be expanded upon, especially as you add readings to it. There's a set of kind of ways you can you have to need to prepare for each lesson and they use different kinds of tools. Like this first one is using World Cafe. Another one uses Chalk Talk. Another uses Story Circles. So you're introducing these different dialogue and deliberation methods, which can be used in person, but can also be used virtually. Um, I've used this the toolkit in both the ways. Uh, and then each of them has kind of lays out what you do. So you do an introductory section for 15 minutes, and then there's a small group and multiple rounds. Um, so these, these are the rest of the different sections of the book. So there's a developing concepts, ask what is a civic professional? And there's two different lessons. There's a few different lessons on that. One, what is a civic professional? There's a whole bunch of case studies around civic professionalism in action. There's a set of habits and having people define what civic professionals are. You can see what the learning objectives are for that. And then there's this lesson on kind of connecting careers in the common good. And it's a really concrete activity that asks people to prioritize what, you know, their kind of future work and how that connects with both um, career and, and livelihood. The next section is, and I think this is actually the most useful section, is around building skills. So on any of your campuses, if you're thinking about public skills, these are five different sets of public skills and ways to develop them. One's on facilitation, and you can, there's an activity called the Neutrality Challenge. One on using a skill um, called public narrative, which was developed by Marshall Gans at Harvard University, where you help students develop their public stories of self, us, and now. Another on asset-based community development to help in students see communities as half full instead of half empty. Uh, one-to-ones, this is a, a lesson on training to do one-to-ones, which is kind of a core relationship building skill developed by the Industrial Areas Foundation and other community organizers. And then there's a finally a skill building activity on kind of naming and framing problems and then asking strategic questions. So kind of a bookend with facilitation uh, but if you're going to do be an effective facilitator, you also have to know how to name and frame problems and ask strategic questions. So each of these are different lessons, 75 minutes with really concrete activities that go along with them. Uh, and then the last sections are around putting into practice with a series of vignettes. 
and here's an example of like community vignettes, like this is what would happen. There's campus vignettes, and then there's facilitation vignettes about kind of you're leading a dialogue, what would you do? And then the last lesson is a case study on youth advocacy and public policy where folks can read the case study and you have there's different stakeholders and how would they respond. And then there's an assessment rubric and it's, it's a, meant to be about around democratic assessment. So not the usual way of like thinking about going from a novice to a master, but really instead just having a series of questions that students can ask along the way that they, <laughs> as they move towards mastery. And this set of skills like sharing public narratives, listening eloquently, naming and framing community challenges, working across differences, facilitating, engaging in public work, and reflecting in community practice. So we wanted to leave you and introduce this, um, this guide uh, as something that might be useful for you. It's a free guide, so and we put the link in it. So it's something you know you could use any one of these lessons on your campus. Um, and it's something that was developed in conversation with Lena and others as part of this Kettering work group. And then I've piloted it with students in Providence College and at College Unbound. Um, we're, I will stop there. We just got a few minutes left. And, um, and we just want to see in these last kind of moments, things that you are taking away, questions that you have, things that you would like to kind of further engage with and like have Campus Compact think about as we're developing resources for community colleges and ways that you can be and be more and more part of a in network and in conversation. What other resources do you need? How, how might some of these findings and resources be useful? So we just want to open it up for these last few minutes. I can't uh, let the silence last. So I'll just quickly say how refreshing it is to hear others talk about some of the same challenges that I face. So thank you very much for uh, putting this together, giving us a chance to talk about those challenges and realize that I'm not alone. So that would be my beginning. Thank you so much. Kind of our time constraints. Um, I will perhaps I can share, and I'm I'm sure I can do this, Natalie. Maybe share via email, kind of the some of how um, some of the thinking around using uh, some of the models in 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 Nick's guidebook, you know, to engage students in in kind of reconfiguring and re envisioning civic and community engagement, you know, on on my campus. So kind of what some of what's emerging from that. So. So I'd uh, I'd be happy to share that with you through some other means since we probably needed two hours for this for this discussion. <laughs> Any other resources or ways like so I think David's kind of feedback, you know, part of these is just like an hour every day, realizing I'm not alone, meeting with other folks who are doing work in community colleges. That's helpful. Any other ways, like things like this, that would be helpful in developing over the next year or two, uh, ideas for Campus Compact to be using that network to do it? And it um, I think, you know, from, from my experience working with the Montana Campus Compact and serving on our advisory board, and we just had our in-person meeting here a week or so ago, um, I think these resources are awesome. I mean, you know, we we meet once a year as a, all the campuses together in the state of Montana, and um, it's the best thing for us to be able to connect and share our concerns and our, our challenges, that kind of thing. And so I think whenever you can have a resource like what you just presented is perfect. You know what I mean? I mean, I will be sending that out to everybody else like, hey, you got to check this out because those are the things that we talk about in person. So I think anything like that, that you can provide community colleges with an easy way to like, you know, just maybe rebuild our community involvement or community engagement, civic engagement programming and resources, I think would be extremely helpful.
That's super helpful. Yeah, and I also heard like the importance of face-to-face -face conversations as well as doing these remote work. Like I think that's like just so important. Uh, and then it sounds like we're all of us like COVID shut down so much of our community engagement work, or we had to rethink and reimagine it um, for that time. And now it hasn't reemerged in the same way, but that also opens up some opportunities. So what are ways that we can re rebuild our community engagement program? So that's more deeper, it's more reciprocal. It's really addressing uh, challenges and building on people's talents. So the, anyone who's developing resources has ideas about that, like we wanna be in conversation with. So I realize it's it's three o'clock. Um, Lena and I want to thank you so much. Um, one thing, so Lena will be following up. We wanted she wants to be. I think you'll she'll say more, but be part of that conversation around community colleges. I hope you get a chance to use the Practicing Democracy Toolkit, and if you use it or have ideas for how to develop it further, I would love to hear from you. So it's a kind of a, it's meant to be a living document. Um, so please check it out, send it around, but then if you use it and you see like, oh, here's some ways it can be improved, or here's some other lessons that should be added in, we'd love to hear from you. And and one more pitch, you know, for you to fill out the, the survey. And if writing it out would take too much time, I love talking to people. So there's a link to my Calendly scheduler in the survey, <laughs> if you just want to talk. Or if you want to do both, but I'd love to to have some more, you know, detailed feedback uh, and and more of your insights. So, great. great. Well, thank you both so much for your insights and for being here, and thank you all for being here. Um, I hope you are seeing our announcements about Compact Twenty Four because we are. Um, Registration is open, and if you're a member, we, there's a deep discount currently. Um, we will also be launching our summer communities of practice next week, so keep your eyes open for that. Um, we've got a lot going on. We're really excited. So um, Shaquan and I are always here as member engagement folks to support you in any way, so feel free to reach out, and thank you again for being here. <laughs>